Real hackers want to learn why that works. Real security people, not only just hackers like as far as offensive security goes, but blue teamers as well. Because now, if I understand how that exploit works, I can better defend against it. Which cybersecurity career path is right for you? Do you know you want to be in cybersecurity, but don't know which career path or really niche is the best one to choose? Well, in today's episode, we're unlocking the doors to the cybersecurity universe. Whether you're a strategic problem thinker, a problem solving pro, or just a tech enthusiast, there's a niche in this dynamic field that's just right for you. Helping me with this today is IT Pro TV trainer, Daniel, with his years of experience in the cybersecurity industry. Welcome to the show, Daniel. Do you mind taking a few minutes and introducing yourself? I'm hoping there's a few people out there that don't know who I am. I'm, I'm gonna assume <laughs> that that is true. I'm not like a celebrity or anything. I'm just a guy on the internet that talks about cybersecurity from time to time, hence the reason we're here doing this. But if you don't know who I am, I'm Daniel Lowry. I am a cybersecurity enthusiast. I'm also a cybersecurity trainer. I work for um, IT Pro from ACI Learning. Uh, back before when it was IT Pro TV, if you've heard of that. I've been doing cybersecurity training now for like, I can't remember. I think it's like somewhere between five to seven years. Before that, I worked as a sysadmin and network admin. And before that, I was an in-classroom trainer. So I've I've done the training thing that I've done the, you know, workstation support through admin thing. And then a friend of mine said, Hey, I started a business. You, you should come back into training and doing this online thing. And then started doing that and just really found a niche because I got interested in cybersecurity and thought this looks really cool. I always liked it. Right. Kid watching war games. Shall we play a game? Oh, watching oddly enough, like Jurassic park, whatever it did, it did it all. But with the key checks off, the computer didn't file the keystroke. Anything with a computer where you were doing stuff that you weren't supposed to seemed really cool to me. So I was always like drawn to it, but I never had the, I didn't have the follow through. It was interesting enough for me to learn a thing or two about a thing or two, but nothing crazy. And then one day I was like, I'm going to learn this stuff. So I just started really trying and that grew into, well, now that I know something, I should teach it because teaching helps you like solidify those things. So I just started teaching yep. it for, uh, cause I, I, I was just like a host. I was just like introing stuff, kind of like what you're doing right now. And they said, man, I bet you could do that with the, the subject. I said, yeah, I think I can. So I started doing it and that's what I've been doing ever since. So years now got my own YouTube channel going, trying to get that thing rocking and rolling and trying to teach and learn at the same time. Right. Cause anybody that tells you that they are tip of the mountaintop, in cybersecurity, they are <laughs> lying to you. They are trying to sell you something. I have talked yep. to people that are well beyond my skill set. John Hammond, John Strand, Heath Adams, you know, you name it. Mike Saunders, Tim Medin, Dave Kennedy, you name it. I've talked to these people and I always ask them, are you satisfied with your current skill set? And if not, what are you doing to up your game? Because you think, oh, they've got it all figured out. New stuff comes out all the time, so you have to constantly be learning new stuff. Yeah, no, new stuff comes out hourly. It's 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 crazy. I think that's one of the things that draws a lot of people into the industry. It's constantly evolving. It's not you're not doing the same thing day in and day out. Yeah, and it if you like constantly learning new stuff, if you can get that, I got this weird thing about my brain that if I find something interesting, I can I can laser focus in on it, and the world shuts off. I, I believe technically it's called executive attention where I'm <laughs> able to just go into my lofty tower and the whole world goes away. And I just sit and I'm like, this is very interesting. I like this. This is making my brain happy. I'm actually technically getting a dopamine hit because it's interesting to me. And I kind of like that. It's really hard sometimes like that. It's difficult. And then I, st I remember started going I, I, that I figured out that I liked it. I remember figuring out that I liked that was I was trying, I think it was through buffer overflows. I was learning buffer overflows. I wanted to, I, I was like, if, th if I can learn how to do this, I'll be, I'll be good in calling myself a hacker. You know, this was years ago, you know, cause you got that imposter syndrome always kicking you in the back of the head going, you're not, you're yeah. nothing. You're nobody. You don't know how to do this. You suck. Right. And I thought if I can, if I can do buffer overflows, if I can get that down to where I can just do them, then I'll, I'll, I'll be co comfortable calling myself a hacker. And it was really hard to kind of pick up all that stuff because almost the entirety of it was foreign to me. 
you know, memory protections and figuring out what a buffer was and how it worked and memory space address locations and little Indian versus big Indian and all the fun stuff that went in on that. And once I knew, I'm like, I got this stuff. I, I understand it. I can, I understand it so much. I can teach it. I could teach you how to do it. That's when I thought I've got it. And I was like, I really like that. The, the, there was like satisfaction in the overcoming of a great obstacle. And it wasn't, once I figured it out, I was like, oh, okay, well now I know how to do that. What's next? What can I, what can I do next? What's going to be the next thing that gives me some struggle? And so I'm constantly trying to find that, you know, chasing that down. What's the next thing that's really difficult? Because if I can master that, or if I can at least understand it enough to where I feel comfortable with it, then I've done something. I've really accomplished. I've, I've grown. I've increased. I've become better than I was yesterday. And that's always like what I'm trying to do. That, that's kind of why I started my YouTube channel, because I wanted to kind of make that part of that journey is like me learning as much as I'm showing you anything. It's just so that I can go, okay, I, I don't know what this is. Let me try that. Oh, I, I figured something out. Let's make a video about that. Hopefully you, if you're into cybersecurity and you, you should really enjoy learning and struggling and the immense like uh, hit of awesomeness that comes from defeating it or overcoming it or uh, understanding it, it's totally worth the struggle. If I had to describe the, the most successful people in this industry, they'd be what you just described. People that are so, so passionate about it that they constantly are striving to figure out the next thing. You know, they're not just satisfied with like the basic answer. You know, you go research something on Google and like, oh, that's how it is. Okay. But they ask why, why does that work like that? Why do you do this? Why, how can I break that? That is like the essence of like a successful cybersecurity person. And I really think you have to find that inner drive if you want to be in this career. And I think that's just can be said for tech in general. Like I am not a cybersecurity person. I'll never claim to be. I am a networking person. I have that same level of drive when it comes to networking. Because network's awesome. I just, it's what fuels me on a day-to-day -day basis. There's not a single day that goes by that I don't try to like figure out something new and how to break something. Oh gosh, don't even get me started on like BGP and stuff like that. You know, it gets, it just, I, I will go down the hard. rabbit hole. No, that is not hard at all. Uh -uh. But Super anyway, easy. <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. My day is fueled with Google, ChatGBT, and Reddit. Give me those three things and you won't see me for days just because I'll just go down that rabbit hole. Like, oh, okay, so I think I got to understand this, but let's understand this next part. It really makes the job enjoyable. Yeah, I remember I asked Tim Medine one time. He's CEO of Red Siege, but he's also a principal uh, security consultant for them. He discovered, and I guess you can, for lack of a better word, invented Kerber Roasting which is a way to manipulate, you know, the Kerberos uh, system that Windows uses for authentication and ticket generation and everything. And I, I asked him, I said, how the heck did you figure that out? Like, what was it? And he said, you know, we just having a conversation. I was trying to learn more about Kerberos and how that worked. And I was talking to some people. I was at a con. And then, we, you know, that, that conversation led over to the bar where we were having drinks. And then I started scratching my head and I was reading the RFCs on Kerberos and how it worked. The next thing I know, I was like, you don't think that it would, it sure as heck does, you know? And <laughs> that's how it goes. I, and I love that you're a network guy because I used to be really into networking. Like, like that was, that was also my passion at one time. I think networking is a gateway drug easily, you know, in the tech field, networking is the gateway drug. <laughs> and, and if you want something difficult to overcome, man, figuring out where the heck your spanning loop is going on, and getting that fixed, yep. right? Or, or having a routing loop or whatever the problem case is, right? DNS just isn't working because it sucks all the time. Um, you know, there's always some good networking problem for you to overcome. I feel like, ne you know, networking used to be, especially in the Cisco realm, right? If you had that CCIE, you were a golden god floating around. You know, your feet never touched the ground. Oh, yeah. You know, cybersecurity is trying to, trying to pull that spotlight away. Those, anybody with, any, like, even the CCNA level, honestly... You know a thing or two about a thing or two. You are a smart yeah. person and you are a learned person and you should be proud that you have that certification because it's not easy to obtain. You think, oh, everything's going to the cloud. You think the clouds don't use networks? It's all still there. So my hat's off to you folks out there working on the higher level stuff, like you said, BGP and stuff like that. It's super difficult. But once it's humming and purring, that's what makes the internet go. And without it, we all just sit there and look at books again, I guess. Let's talk about the people that are 
trying to break into the cybersecurity field, what are some of the top things you recommend, like top some of the top skills people go out and learn if they want to break into cybersecurity in general? We're not going to even dive down the different niches yet. All right. Well, I, I think we've hit probably the big one, which is tenacity, stick to itiveness, like the dog with a bone. I'm never going to give up until I figure this out. I'm not going to sit here and say that there has been a night or two that I've neglected my family, <laughs> but it's probably happened more than once. Where I just, you know, that laser focus comes in. So if you've got that, that's going to be a huge help. And so a lot of it is a, is a mindset, right? And that's, that doesn't matter whether you're in the blue team or the red team, right? If you're a breaker or a builder, both are absolutely necessary where you have that. It's a puzzle and I need to figure this out and it won't let you go. You can't lay your head to the pillow and it's really hard to shut it off. So if you can cultivate that, if you don't have that naturally, I believe you can't cultivate it. You just have to say, I'm going to work on this and I'm going to put my brain to this. And eventually that will just become your modus operandi. So that's going to be a big help where you're, you're looking at it from every single angle possible. And like I said, it doesn't matter if you're coming from a defensive uh, side of things or offensive side of things, you're looking at a problem that needs to be solved and it just won't let you go. You got to learn to, to moderate that. <laughs> Otherwise you, know, you, you lose your mind. So we want to avoid that. Exactly. But when it comes down to hard skills in defensive security, it's going to come down to because you got a lot of ground to cover. So this is slow and steady wins the race. But pick up skills like let's just start with firewalls, right? Firewalls are one of our first lines of defense. How do I make an effective set of firewall rules? Because you got all these bad things coming in and you've got to let things go out and you've got to open up services Otherwise, what was the purpose of starting them, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, well, I mean, I have a web server. I dare not put it on the internet, though. <laughs> Why? Yes. You, you should. But if you can figure out how to start working with firewalls, that's going to be a great one. Uh, understanding just security in general. I love the idea. I remember when I learned how to pick a lock, right? Did a, did a lock picking village at a con. I believe it was a B-Sides in Vegas or something. Nice. And I was like, you know. What, what's what's going on here? Let's you, you're saying you can teach me how to pick a lock really quick. And the guy sat down and in about ten minutes. I'm picking locks, and now I'm like a crazy person. I got locks everywhere and lock picks going everywhere, <laughs> and it just becomes like you're just sitting around picking locks for no good reason. But it teaches you a lot about like a simple lock. What is it? It's a security mechanism, and this is the way you got to start thinking about everything that's in your system. It's meant to do something. What's it meant to do? It's meant to secure something. Okay. How does it do that? Well, it, it stops it from opening. Okay. How does it do that? Well, it, it puts a bar of steel. Okay. Well, how can I bypass that bar? I could cut it. I could, you know, maybe explode it, but that's going to be really hard to do and really messy. It'd be better just to go after the weaker mechanism because that, that chrome molly bar that sticks through whatever lock system you've got is going to be a hard nut to crack unless you got a big pair of bolt cutters, right? It's easier just to go there and pull your block picks out and stick it in there and see if you can jiggle around some pins. But if you learn how the pin system works, now you learn where is it weak. So thinking about weaknesses and thinking about systems, again, it's a lot of it is mindset. You know, I used to be really bored with the stuff like CIA triad. That stuff used to really kind of bore me because it's very theoretical, but it becomes very applicable. Once you get past that, okay, you have to learn this foundation of theory, it, it's very helpful <laughs> to, to get those foundations laid so that you can build upon them. You can do it like I did where, you, where I was kind of like hodgepodging things together, but I always found myself going, ah, oh, that relies on knowing that. And I, I skipped that. I thought this looked cooler. So I wanted to go to that. So it's <laughs> just really helpful to, to start off going, let me understand the foundations. Let me understand the basics of security. What is the security system? How is it supposed to work? What does it mean when we say confidentiality? What does it mean when we say integrity? What does it mean when we say availability? Why is the, why are those important and how do they uh, apply? That you know, you talked earlier about being that person that asks, uh, that asks why. I was that kid. I did horrible in school because I couldn't never let the class go forward because I was like, but why? <laughs> I, I question why do we do that? I found my teacher tell me a lot of times, just hit the I believe button right now and go with me on this. And it was hard for me because I wanted, I wanted to run to the finish line as fast as I could. And I didn't realize that there was a lot to be gained in the journey going to the finish line. Once I, once I switched that in my head, I, I flipped that switch. It became like, okay, I cannot skip things. 
I need to learn them. And that's me personally. We talk about what is the path to cybersecurity. And that doesn't matter for what endpoint you're looking at. If you want to do cloud security, network security, offensive security, you know, uh, web app security, doesn't matter. Pick your poison. It's easy to want to run to that finish line and bypass anything. I always get people that say, do I have to learn programming? I'm like, <laughs> wrong, wrong. Do I get to learn programming? That's, right. that's how, that's what I mean. You got to switch that thing in your brain that says, try to go as fast as you can. Don't, don't get me wrong. Go fast, go as fast as you can, because there's a lot to learn. And there's a lot that can be done by doing that stuff. But when I became a trainer, I didn't ever want to be that trainer that said, just hit, I believe for me right now. Can't always get away with that. Like sometimes you got to say, no. we have to move on or we're never going to get through this. And I promise right. you, if you just hit the, I believe right now, I will answer that why question in the very soon in the future. But right now hit the, I believe, but I try to every turn I get go, I know you're going cross site scripting sounds horrible, Daniel. How do you do that? Why does that work? And how, oh, okay. I hear you. Let's, Let's do this. Let's show you cross-site scripting and showing you that it makes more sense, it becomes more tangible. It makes something you can grab your hands a hold of and sink your teeth into and go, I get it. I see. Right. Right. So I always try when I'm doing training to go, uh, I, I don't want you. I want you to hit the, I believe button as little as humanly possible. In, when I'm doing training, I'm going to show it to you. And that might take a little bit more time, but you'll be better for the storm. You know what I mean? Like the fact that you dug in and go, I'm going to just sit down and we're going to learn this and you're going to show this to me. That's going to be better for you in the long run. Yeah, don't get me. There's those, you know, savants out there that just sleep on a book and absorb all the knowledge. And it it's just oh. practical to them. I know it's very, very so, so frustrating to someone like me that's like a practical learner. Like I'm a hands-on learner. I, like I, I open up a book and I'm asleep in like 10 seconds. It could be the best book ever, but it doesn't matter. I, I have to be in the weeds. That's that's exactly me, man. I'm identically the same way. Yeah. You open that book and it, I, it, if, if I was suffering from insomnia, I'd be out in two seconds. I think it goes without saying like that foundational knowledge is key. It's like building a house. Like you have to have that good foundational knowledge in cybersecurity to be able to build, build upon and advance your career. Yeah, no doubt. And, and hands-on that, I think that's the other great thing that you can do. And I get this question a lot and they're like, what can I do to get some hands-on experience? I'm like, have you not heard of home labs? Okay. Well, there's things like you can build yeah. a lab at home. We have virtualization and it doesn't really tax. I mean, unless you got a really old system, with not a lot of juice going on, then yeah, you, you'll need to upgrade. But you can you can buy stuff has become way less expensive. I mean, even with a Raspi anymore, you get a Raspi five with eight gigs of RAM, and you can yeah. do a thing or two with that. You might not be able to do everything, but dude, I've cobbled together stuff from just old laptops and went to yard sales and just be like, how much for that? They're like twenty five bucks and take it. I'm like, cool, I can run it as a headless Linux server and and stick stuff on it. My wife hates that. I know, I know. My wife hates it when I do that. <laughs> But yes, because you got a pile of junk. I have so many Dell Optiplex uh, computers just sitting in my garage right here, like waiting for my next project. Yeah, but oh. it's it's invaluable. It, it absolutely is. This is the way. And, and the great thing about it is if you're looking at your resume and you're looking at a job post and the job post says, oh, you know, pick your tool. Let's say let's go SQL map, right? You go. Cool. I've heard of SQL map. You can write down familiar with SQL map. And that's, that's nice. Or you could have built a lab and run SQL map and figure out all the little switches and flips that it does and figure out why it does that. And then try something different and don't worry about breaking it. Cause who cares? You just rebuild it. And even in the building, in the rebuilding of those labs, you're gaining all this experience. You're doing stuff. Absolutely. Here's a fun shocker, ladies and gentlemen. You know how when you read a book and it says, do this, do that, and you follow these steps and you follow the bouncing ball and everything works in, in the book. And then you go to try to do that in real life land and it goes, cannot find or blah, blah, blah. You know, you're like, why is this error happening? Why, you know, and then you're on Google. Why is this? I'm getting error number, you know, and you're <laughs> like, oh, okay, well, I got that. Okay, I got to change this. I was just trying to install the other day. I was working with uh, a C2 framework trying to get it stood up on a different system that it wasn't pre-installed on. I was like, let me install this here. And it did. It was like, nope, nope. You're missing this dependency. You're missing that dependency. Oh, you've got this version of that, but I need this version. I'm like, and I'm having to fix all this dependency broken stuff. And, but I got a lot of experience doing that and it was tough, 
But through those difficult trials, I learned a lot about how that system works and where it hides files and what it's depending on to make everything work. And I'm like, oh, this is where you're putting that, huh? Let me, let me go look at that file. What's inside of it? What, what's the magical incantation inside of this file that makes this whole thing work and was the linchpin to keeping it from installing correctly? Hmm, that's an interesting thing. And I do tend to rabbit trail a lot because of that, but it's kind of like a choose your own adventure, <laughs> right? Where yeah. you're like, do, you know, uh, did you ever see um, the Starship Troopers? Where yes. the, the news would be on and it was like, you know, the bugs attacked planet so-and-so. Would you like to know more? And you would click and it's like, that's me learning about stuff. It's like, that's an interesting thing. Let me learn more about that. source of the bug. And then I got to go back to where I began. And I, this whole, it, you'd hate to mind map it. It would just be the worst thing you'd ever seen in your life. But I learn a ton of stuff doing that. And I love that after struggling with that stuff, you really understand these things. So kind of going back to those skills, build that lab, struggle with that lab. I know like I, I work for ACL learning. We have labs. You can go there. And if you get a membership and sign up, they're going to, you can have labs. You can have labs. Labs are there and it'll walk you through and it'll hold your hand. Try hack me has labs that will walk you through and hold your hand. Hack the box has stuff that'll do that. Uh, you know, you know, it's uh, blue team labs online. They have that. Everybody's got labs and labs are great. They are a, a necessary thing. But if you are relying solely on that lab, again, remember, don't, don't hear me say, don't use walkthrough guided labs. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying they are a tool that you eventually want to walk away from and only go back to when it's something new, right? But eventually you want to get away from it telling you there's a SQL injection in this lab. Use what we've taught you to find the SQL injection, find the flag, paste it here, which is great. But what happens if I parachute you into a network and go find something? <laughs> Good luck. Because that's the real world. Right. Because that's the real world. Or if you were in a, a, a blue team, right? And I said, here's your network. Good luck. Yep. If there's an intrusion, it's up to you to find it. Do you know how to do that? You know, there's a lot of different ways in which you can, especially if you're doing blue team stuff, you know, it, it's really crazy on red team. We have these exams that you can go take and get certifications. And, the, and there's a lot of practical ones out there, right? You've got PJPT and PMPT by TCM security. You've got EJPT and ECPPT by eLearn security. You've got OSCP. Oh man. You know, and the list goes on. It's an acronym soup out there. Exactly. And it's all practical. They, they drop you into an environment and go hack your way through this, write a report, give an oral, whatever you got to do. Blue team side of things is starting to catch up on this. Thank goodness. That's a good thing. I love practical exams. Right. Long gone should be the days of what port is HTTP on? Man, if you don't know that, <laughs> that, that no, I'm not saying they shouldn't be here. I'm just saying that's the very basic stuff. That's your security plus. Yeah. Great exam. You need to know those things. But once you get to where you're putting hands on keyboards and you're driving, that, that should be just like assumed knowledge at that point, right? Exactly. So that's the kind of progression you want to take. You want to learn that foundations so that when you can get up into those, they shouldn't have to be reteaching you those things. It should just be, okay, we got a web server. You know what a web server is. You know what common ports they're on. Is it secure or is it insecure? Do the thing to find out. Read the Splunk, the Splunk logs. Use Kibana. Use Waza. You know, is your EDR doing everything that it's supposed to do and it hasn't detected anything. And if so, what, you know, if it's offensive, okay, you're trying to bypass AV. What does that look like? What are the mechanisms and tools that you would use? What are some of the common security foibles that we see out there where people are using, you know, crap passwords, you know, you go and hack the box or anything. I love hack the box, by the way, huge fan. Hack the box is probably my favorite cybersecurity range because it's really hard. Oh yeah. Right. They're super hard. They're way harder than everybody else. At least in my experience. I haven't done them all, but <laughs> they, they tend to be a little more because they don't hold your hand a lot, if at all. I mean, right. you got the forums, you can go check the forums, but I try not to do that. I try to just do research and see if I can figure it out because I don't want to have to be able to go, man, it was that weird thread on the forum where someone hinted the right way and it made me go, oh, I didn't think about that. I just want to be able to do the research. But in real life land, People leave FTP servers open and you can anonymous log in and there's, there's sensitive stuff there. People use junky passwords. You know, you should, you, I, I've been a trainer now for, if I add it all together, probably like 12 years. And anytime I teach password cracking, someone goes, the only reason you crack that password, Daniel, is because 
it was summer 2020. And I go, do you know why it was summer 2020? Because people use summer 2020. And then I pull up Google and I go, watch this. <laughs> 10 most commonly used passwords. And the number one with a bullet is password one. You know, and then it's one, two, three, four, five, six, and then QWERTY. I'm like, these are the most commonly used passwords. This is why yep. like password spraying works because some person does not realize that that's not a good thing to do. And the defensive person out there allowed them to use it. So that's why we do pen testing. Not, not to go, ha, 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 we, we got you there, blue team. How's that feel? How's that stir your tea? True. No, we go, Hey, whoa. We found that you had a login for X, Y, or Z system. We found a bunch of users and we just tried brute forcing with commonly used passwords. And we found one that worked and they were an admin. They're like, oh no. Or you were using the defaults. It ran to, it, it just, I logged in with admin, admin, because no one changed that. Oh, we That's didn't think the worst. Find it. Yeah. But it happens every single day. You were running an unpatched version or, a, you know, that. I mean, I think of the Equifax, right? Equifax, what happened? They were running an unpatched version of Apache, Apache Struts. They waited a little too long to get that done. <laughs> and it was one, it was a massive hack, right? This stuff happens all the time. This is two things you should be doing, talking about getting skills. Read the Hacker News every day. Read, uh, I want to say it's CISO online or... Uh, CISO magazine. It's one of the two. I, I, I remember, I can't remember the one off the top of my head because there's a few of them that start with CISO. So fact check me on that one. But be reading security news every single day. Take 15, 20 minutes, read through the articles for that day and go, wow. And you start looking at malware and it's like, oh, that's all the same thing. All these malware things are the same. They're just written by different people. They send a fish. Someone clicks the fish. Someone downloads the fish, they run the fish, <laughs> and then they get access. Okay, so that's the initial compromise. Great. Then what do they do? Then they start getting staged payloads. Stage two does this, stage three does that, and then it's doing persistent. It's the same thing over and over again. It's either PowerShell, probably PowerShell, or maybe WMI. Like, it's just the same. It's lather, rinse, repeat just with, from a different author. Yeah. And you'll start to see those patterns, and you'll go, huh, how about that? It's not a whole lot different from thing to thing. But the only way you're going to see those patterns is if you're immersing yourself. It's like learning a language, right? Right. The best way to learn that language is just immerse yourself into that, that culture, immerse yourself into that language where you're doing it every day. And then it just starts, you start to see the patterns and you go, oh yeah, I get this. This makes sense. And then you just got to start to ask yourself what kind of thing thrills you most? Is it Writing, you know, like setting up a really cool WAF or EDR system or a SIEM solution or SIM solution. I don't know how most people, it's a religious war on whether or not it's SIM or SIEM. <laughs> All I know is B-E-L-I-E-V-E -E -E is believe, not believe. <laughs> <laughs> I kid uh, me the SIM people. Well, I say SIEM, but there yes. you go. <laughs> but that's what you do, right? You, you have to figure that out. That's going to push you into, okay, now what do I need to learn? If you want to do that blue team thing, you want to be defensive, you want to stop those bad guys out there, go download Security Onion and start messing with it. Download Waza and start messing with it. Get all, get all that elk stack business going on and start having a good time and figure that stuff out. And guess what? At the end of the day, when you've struggled through it not working and getting it to do the thing it's supposed to do and the agent's not reporting, and why is this? Uh, I can't get... Uh, and at the, when you finally reach that finish line where things are working, you're like, okay, this is all doing what I think it should be doing. I can throw like a brute force and it goes, oh, yep, I've alerted the dad. I'm getting an email. There's an SMS. Cool. Everything's happening. Now on your resume, you get to write experience with, not just familiar with. That's huge. That is massive. Yes. Everyone's always complaining, like, I, I want to get a job in cybersecurity. I want to be in blue team. But all these entry-level jobs ask for so many years of experience. Doing these labs, that's you're, you're building your experience. Like, going out and building your own, you know, topology, your own lab environment. That is experience. Like, don't let anyone tell you it's not. You know, you are actually experienced. You understand how this works. You're not just reading a book or a, a white paper on how this works. You are actually doing it and implementing it. And you are building that experience.
advice. That's how you get ahead in this field. That's it. You say you can put that you've put your hands on things, and that is that is a big step up from your competition out there in the job field. So you you absolutely need to be building things. And even if you're a breaker, you need to be building things, right? And that, that kind of goes back <laughs> yes. to, you know, I, I, I used to tell people like, yeah, eventually you'll, you'll need to learn a programming language because it, it's going to come in, in handy. And now I just start saying, yeah. I don't care if you are super green, you just started your first, you know, intro to PCs course or whatever the case is. And maybe you're taking A plus or you know, um, IT fundamentals or something like that from CompTIA. I don't care if that's where you're at. Start learning a programming language. Just start. Yep. It puts you so far ahead of the game. Even if you're not going to be a developer, I'm not saying you got to go be some full stack dev and play with every new technology that comes down the pipe. <laughs> right. But learn the fundamentals of how programming languages work. Understand what a variable is and why you need them. Understand how a loop can help you and, and not just count to 10. Oh my goodness. If I see another, I, I get it. I get why every example is like, here, we're going to use a for loop to count to 10. Here, we're going to use a while loop. We're going to count to 10. I understand what you're doing there, but like most people don't do math in their day to day. <laughs> like I hardly ever do any kind of mathematical equations in my, in my dev environment. Because that's not what I'm doing. I'm trying to build something that bypasses AV. I'm trying to build a tool that will brute force X, Y, or Z that's not built into a tool that already exists. Or I'm just trying to learn more about how to make the language work. So I'm rebuilding a tool that does exist because I need to know how does it deal when it comes to network sockets? Like, how do I make, like right now I'm learning Golang. Better you than me, man. <laughs> I've tried. I, I, I do kind of like uh, what you talked about. Like, it, it's really nice that now that ChatGPT is a thing. And I use uh, a, a few of them. It's not just chat TPT. I'll use Bard from time to time and I'll, you know, kind of like yeah. pop around, but I, I don't go, Hey, write this code for me. What I do is I say, I'm trying to create a network socket and the documentation was written in hieroglyphics by a drunkard. You know, <laughs> I don't understand what they're trying to tell me here. Can you explain it to me? Like I'm five. Yeah. And it's like having an expert in the room that goes, here's the network socket. Here's an example of a network socket working. I can look at it and go, oh, that's what they meant. Okay, now let me jump over here to my dev environment. How can I now incorporate that with what I'm trying to do? All right, I need that piece. I need this piece. Okay, but I'm not doing it that way because I don't care to do that X, Y, or Z thing that ChatGPT did. I want to do it my way. So now I'm just going to start modifying things. And that doesn't mean I still don't go look at Stack Overflow and be like, hey, or get into a, like a Discord server and go, hey, I'm trying to do, you know, you people are a little more skilled at this than I am. Can you help me out? This is how the work gets done. Honestly, if you are really good at Google, you got a, a good couple of Discord servers that you lurk around in and you got ChatGPT and a couple of forum sites that you know are going to be great. That's how you get work done. And then personal people that you know. Yeah. That you, that you know they're experts at X, Y, or Z, and you call them or you send them a message and go, hey, I'm trying to figure out this. When you get a minute, can you give me a holler and help me? And they go, yeah. Or are, are you familiar with this exploit? Have you seen that? And they'll, they'll, you know they have because they're an expert because that's what you know them for. This is, I, in the real life land, that's how things get done. Well, welcome to it. Yes, I know certifications don't allow yeah. you to phone a friend. <laughs> But no, ab absolutely. That is eventually what you're going to be. They just want to test you on, make sure that you can understand and actually deal with some of the basic things. And as you move up, there are certifications that are much more difficult, right? As you move up to the ranks, but you get those certifications that are out there that are meant to kind of test you on those basic foundational skills. And even what you would consider, maybe if you're on, if you're in it fundamentals and a plus land, you're looking at someone with OSCP like they're a god and that they can just, you know, by sheer force of will, manipulate computers. <laughs> it's not the case. They're still in cybersecurity. That means that they have a very good understanding. It's kind of like a CCNA, right? Yeah. They have a very good understanding of the foundational knowledge of that field and can even do a thing or two. And that's why it's become a very good HR bypass for getting into pen testing, red teaming, you know, vulnerability assessment and that kind of stuff because it has gained a name. Now there are competitors in that space now 
and they said, hey, I see what you did there, offensive security. I can do it better. And they're, they're, they're competing in competition, right? That's what I love about, about capitalist society, right? Is that competition is just benefits the consumer. Yeah. Because prices go down and quality goes up and it becomes awesome. And the more you wave the flag of the one you like the best to get out there and talk about it and say, man, I took this exam, I took this training, and it was so helpful and instrumental on me getting to where I am, that's going to give them credit. I always thought that, man, we should have like a, you know, OWASP. If you're not familiar with OWASP, everybody out there, it's this lovely organization that gets security professionals together that talk about the most common web application, API application, mobile application vulnerabilities, and they make these lists and they rank them for the top 10 lists that they have. It's a really great resource. Phenomenal thing. OWASP.org. Check that out. It's got a lot of great stuff there that you can learn from. Free. Completely free. Nothing touched you. No money. My favorite price, free 99, right? <laughs> I always thought we should do that as a community where we have kind of like some, some people that are well-known in the industry as like board members, and we rank certifications and the people out there that are taking them get to also give their two cents, almost like an IMDB certification yeah. and cyber ranges and saying, you know, here's my Google review of, but it's all in one spot and it's curated and you can, we could kind of help weed out the people that are just, you know, no bots, you have to be a registered user. You know, I wish that system existed. If there's anybody out there with the skills to make that happen, I'm on board. Contact me. <laughs> I'd be well behind that. Yeah, because it actually gets really confusing and frustrating because there's so many conflicting information out there like, oh, go after you get this certification. Hey, you need to get this certification right now. How do you weed out that noise and figure out, well, this is actually the certification that is right for me. You know, is there a way to like figure that out? The best thing right now is is probably reviews, like watch YouTube videos of people doing reviews, read people's reviews of not only the training, but the exam itself, because... Sometimes it has great training, but the exam was like, oh, I'm not going to name any names. I'll, I'll keep that to myself, <laughs> right? I'll let you make that decision. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes the training was like, eh, but the exam was like really good. And sometimes it's both. Sometimes it's both good or both bad. So reading reviews is going to be the best thing you can do right now to figure out which cert is right for you. Another really good indicator of whether or not you should get a certification is look at the jobs that you want to get. Start looking for patterns. So if I wanted to be a pen tester, I would go to Indeed. I would go to Dice. I would go to Monster. I would go to all these places. And I would type in pen tester, penetration tester, or whatever the case is, offensive security, vulnerability assessor, anything in that vein. And I would start looking at the either required certs or a lot of times nowadays, they don't just come out and say, you have to have OSCP or it's, it's a non-starter. Don't even try to apply. Now they'll say, must have OSCP or similar certification because there are a lot of similar certifications and the people that are putting up those posts are starting to realize OSCP is not the only game in town. There's a lot of other things that are similar to that, that give just as good, if not better of an experience for certain people. And they shouldn't discount and lose out on hiring some great talent because they didn't go after the OSCP. They went after something else. So they just kind of use that as a litmus test. Now, you know, you might see CEH a lot. Here's the thing about CEH, right? It's, it's got a reputation. And as I always say about that, your reputation precedes you. It's probably got a reputation for a reason. Do your yep. research and then start looking at those job posts. If you see job post after job post after job post going CEH, it might be valuable enough to get, right? If, it, if it's going to be able exactly. to get past that HR because you could put CEH on your list. Don't, don't sit down and go, well, I got the CEH and I'm done because everybody's got CEH on their job post. No, just go, I got that for the purposes of being able to put CEH on my resume so that if it is on the job that I want, I got it. I, I can say it's going to bypass the HR system that says, did you have these keywords? And I do because it's there and then move on to something you think is more tantalizing to your tastes. Absolutely. And you know, I think it's really important to do research because requirements, especially certification requirements, very broadly not only among the different niches in cybersecurity, but also geographically, I found out. In one certain region, all the employers might be really into certain certifications where if you live across the, the country, they don't even care if you have that certification. They want you to have their, you know, this certification. So do your research about for 
what is wanted in your area of not only geographically, but also your niche, your expertise. Hey, I can tell you, hey, you need to go get security plus, you need to go get EJPT, uh, whatever, alphabet soup. That, that doesn't matter. My opinion doesn't matter because what works for me here is not going to work for you out there. You know, I, I was talking to, uh, are you familiar with Jerry Osier from Simply Cyber? Yes. All right. So I was talking to Jerry. Jerry and I are, are pretty good friends. We were talking at Wild West Hacking Fest this year. And we kind of do this where we, we meet at Wild West Hacking Fest and we just sit down and just start spitballing ideas for the year. Like, what are we going to do this year? What's what's on your play? What's on your play? And we like to bounce <laughs> ideas off each other. I said, I should create a talk because I don't really typically do talks at cons. I like to go to cons, not necessarily speak at cons, but I feel like this might be a good talk. Because you just were talking about it. We were kind of thought there is no absolute path. You know, you get those absolute path errors and it's like absolute path, you know, must be used because file not found. Absolute path right. must be right. Oh, okay. There is no absolute path to cybersecurity. There's some general paths to cybersecurity and you can go get that A plus and get that net plus you can get that sec plus and then jump up to it. It's like maybe a CISA or a pen test or EJPT or, you know, blue team BTL one, right? The blue team uh, level one. Ooh. Oh, you're not familiar I with that? I am not the expert to ask. No, good. I'm not the expert to ask. I, I, I'll stick to my networking realm. Very, <laughs> very good certification. If you're on the end of the blue, seat, blue team side of things, you do a lot of like instant response nice. kind of things. And yeah, uh, by the way, that's cool. DFIR is a really cool, you know, any kind of forensic investigation or instant response is a very cool field of cybersecurity. Don't forget cloud. Oh my goodness. It's huge. Please, please, please do not forget cloud. It is the not only the present, but the future. Yep. And guess what? Everybody's still kind of stuck in five years ago. So a lot of my friends are, are pen testers by trade. That's what they do for a living. And I'll get onto them, start talking about cloud stuff. And they're like, bro, I got, I got clients that don't even know what AWS EC2 is. They don't even know what an S3 bucket is, but they got them. Oh my God. Right. And it's like, yeah. Oh, this is crazy. <laughs> so I'm sure their security is amazing, right? Yeah, and they're like, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's not hot. So <laughs> get into like learning some cloud. Go get you like an AWS practitioner uh, cert, and then jump in, jump into because you can always take the side door. You do not, you know. Everybody always talks about, you know, do I have to work at a help desk to get that experience? Should a help desk, you know, should time in the trenches of the help desk? be absolutely necessary. Well, obviously not. There are people that have bypassed the help desk with great success. It has tended to be a really good place to go because you tend to get to deal with a lot of issues and see how things work and how they don't work in a real life situation. And right. there's a low ticket price to entry and you're, you're, you have a job in IT. You're earning experience plus you're earning a living. You're, you're getting a paycheck every day maybe even benefits. It's a really good thing to go, hey, why don't you go get a job on a help desk? But that's not the only game in town. You go get those, those cloud certs, go do a search right now for a Microsoft 365 admin, even a junior. Look at the, look at the price tag on that. Yeah. Because that junk is a pain. But if you figure it out and you start playing with Azure because of it and you start learning a little bit about Azure AD because of it, it's like all of a sudden you are a valuable asset to that company and you you let anybody with an ear know, by the way, I'm really interested in cybersecurity. If we're doing anything security, I will get the coffee. I will, I will do any junk work you got laying around as long as I get to put on the uniform and be in the show. That's all I care. <laughs> I want to be, I want to, I want to yeah. smell the security. Oh, there it is. Yeah. That's good security in the morning right there. I want to be a part of the show. And I want to help any way I can. You start being that person. You start hanging out with those people that are actually doing those things and telling them, hey, man, let's go get coffee. Let's go get lunch. Let me take you out. What are you guys working on, man? What's going on? What do you think? You start picking their brain. They're going to be more than happy to share with you. Only the most stodgiest of old, like it was an old school mentality to kind of guard their knowledge as if it was some sort of sacred tome and only the worthy we're allowed to even touch it. I, that's, that's what <laughs> right. I grew up in. When I tried to get into security back in the late nineties, it was the common answer was RTFM kid. I, I've been RTFM and, and I don't get it. I don't understand why I'm here. They're like, ah, whatever you'll, I had to learn it. And now do you, you do too. Right. And it was very discouraging and it made it very difficult. People nowadays remember that. Like I remember that you ask me something. I'm probably going to tell you the answer if I know it. 
I'm going to help you out. I'm on LinkedIn pretty heavily and I get questions all the time and I way over answer <laughs> at the time, yeah. right? Cause I want to be helpful. I don't want you to sit there struggling. Now do your own work, show that you're not just looking for the answer because that was the easy button. Try, try. and you, you can kind of put that in your response. When you, when you ask someone a question, be like, Hey, I'm working on trying to figure out how SSRF works. And I just don't get it. I know that this is supposed to be this. And I know that's supposed to be that, but I don't understand the connection. Cool. You've proven that you're not just trying to get free training out of somebody because full disclosure, that's how I make my living. People sign up <laughs> for training for a subscription for ACI learning it pro. And that's how I get paid. So hopefully you find that training worthwhile. Then you stick around and you enjoy the training and you get learned up and you get your certs and you do all the things you got all the skills you need. And I've helped you get a job. I can't tell you how many people contact me on the regular basis going, man, you, uh, I took your training and I got my sec plus. I took your training. I got my SISA plus. I got cert nexus certified first responder because I have that cert and I teach that cert. That's so cool. Yeah. You know, it's, it's stuff like that, but it's cool that my training was helpful to you. That's what I really care about at the end of the day was that I didn't just throw a bunch of acronyms at you and go, good luck. I really try to help you and try to make you understand that. And if you reach out and go, Hey man, I just don't get this. You talked about X, Y, or Z and I just don't get it. I want to help. And everybody that you like that you invest in and show them that you're really trying, they're going to invest right back. And there's so many people in this, this community go to, go to any conference and just strike up a conversation with somebody. Oh yeah. Let them know if you're new, let them know I'm new to this man, but this is so awesome. I love this stuff. And they're going to be like, cool. What are you into? You know, what are you trying to learn right now? And, oh, you know, I'm on hack the box right now. I'm, I'm going through try hack me trying to bust into that top, whatever percentage. And I'm really kind of struggling with blank. Oh yeah. I know all about it. Let me tell you, you just sit down right there and have a conversation. You'll learn more from those types of conversations, hanging out in discords. And that kind of takes me to, I love a lot of the certs that are out there right now. I don't love a lot of the certs that are out there right now as well, because they kind of have that old school mentality. I love all these practical ones. I love that the, the security industry in large is moving that way to where let's just do practical hands-on stuff. Cause then there won't be any, yeah. you know, a brain dump of how to hack through a network. You know, it's going to be different. Right. It's going to be, you know, it's, it's, is it possible? Yes, but it's not likely. It's not something easily done. Like developers, not that they don't have certifications, they do, but largely they get jobs based off of their body of work. That's where I want to see security go. That you have a GitHub repo, you have tools that you have built, you have a blog or a, a YouTube channel, or you're very active in something like LinkedIn or X or pick your social platform and that becomes where you go but you're constantly giving to the community and you're building a brand. You are not only selling your skills, you're selling you. And that's one of the yeah. big things that you can do to get into this business. You know, there, uh, we talked about Jerry Ozier and simply cyber. There's a guy named Jesse in his community. He was learning security plus came from not an it background. And he was like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to spin up a, a study group. Hey, let's go. He calls it slay sec plus and they get together and he passed the security plus within like six months. And then like a month or two later, he got his first job and now he's moving on to his yeah. next job. And he's, he's, he's doing the thing. He built himself up. He built himself as a brand. He built himself as I don't know this, but I'm learning this and I'll, I'll show you everything. Warts and all. And, and that's the future on how to do this. And people, though. Yes. I want to be, I, I would love to see a world where, if you have certs, that's great. But if you don't, that's not a game. It's like a, a conversation stopper. Yeah. You go, cool. Yeah. I don't have certs, but I have, look at all these tools I built. Look at this. Look at my YouTube channel. Look at my LinkedIn. I'm very active. I write these blogs. I, I write one blog a week. I'm just, you know, talking about the latest security vulnerabilities and how you can defend or attack or how they can be whatever. Choose your poison, pick whatever you're passionate about and start doing it every week. One thing every week. Build that brand, get in there, become someone that people know who you are. Go to conferences. That is the next big, that right there is probably the biggest hack to work. Because if I know your name, I know who you are. I met this kid, Joseph. 
at Wildwest Hackenfest. Ne- never met him before in my life. We are now pretty chatty on LinkedIn because <laughs> he was like, oh man, I took your training and I got this certification. Now I'm going to work on my next certification. I love your stuff. I'm like, oh, awesome. What do you want to do? And we just, and you could tell he was just a good dude. And I'm like, man, if I hear of any work, first name coming to my head, Joe, I'm going to call, I'm going to let him know about Joe. He's smart <laughs> as a whip. He's really great because he's somebody you would want on your team. He's super passionate. You can tell just by a five minute conversation that he's ultra passionate about security. He loves it. You know, what's even so great about this, just going back to like having a blog and, you know, being active in the community, you Joe needs a job and you all of a sudden know someone who needs a Joe before you even make that introduction. You should be like, Hey, I know this person. Here's their website. Go yep. check them out. And they're going to find out everything they need to know about you before they even send an email saying, Hey, are you interested in a job? I got a job, right? You know, I, I just did a video about this, you know, and this, this isn't just cybersecurity. This is, I think the tech industry in general, this is where we're going. Yep. The importance of having a website about having a GitHub repository. You know, I'm going to put on my other hat, you know, at my day job, I'm a director of network operation. I am also the hiring manager for network operation. When I see someone who has a website, a GitHub, or at least even links their LinkedIn profile, my scroll instantly stops. You know, I, I spend on average, I'd say like 10 seconds looking through a resume. I'm going to skim through it. And all, once you look at one resume, you've looked at them all. They're all just boring. And most of the time they're just like people put skills they don't even have. And it gets, it gets so old. Yeah. As soon as I see that link to a website, I, I am instantly clicking on it and I'm diving in. I'm like, I'm looking how they've formatted it. I've looking how their presentation skills. I heard the story. I saw uh, Tom Lawrence is a YouTuber out on, on here on YouTube and you know, he runs an MSP and he was talking about one time he was hiring for like just a basic computer, like salesman and like doing basic computer repairs. And he had this one guy that applied and came in on his resume looked pretty blank. Like it just, yeah, I think he said he worked for his parents' flower shop and stuff like that. But on that resume, he had a link to a GitHub repository where the, the dude had made major contributions to like Wikipedia and like just all these major contributions. That he ended up getting the job and ended up progressing up the ladder because of that. These were things that weren't even discussed during the interview, but having that presence and that involvement in the community just went the extra mile. And I think that is huge. And sure, if you're extremely passionate, like you know, you or me, or go out and create yourself a YouTube channel. I think that is amazing. Start start teaching these skills and referencing that you truly do know this knowledge, and that is just going to go above and beyond. Yeah. Do, doing a video format is probably one of the best things you can do because then they can see you, Yeah, right? They can see your personality. They can see like what you're going to be like, whether or not you'd be a good fit for their team. And don't worry if you're not everyone's cup of tea, that's fine. And don't, don't chase subscribers and don't chase clicks and don't chase be you all that stuff. Do it because you like it. Do it because you're passionate about it. Don't worry about how bad you're going to look in those first few videos and how, you know, you're going to stutter and you're going to misspeak about stuff. And someone's going to, don't worry about the, the people that get in the comments and go, this is really garbage stuff. You know, you're an idiot, blah, blah, blah. I don't, I mean, I've been doing this long enough that that junk just happens. There's people out there yep. that just want to make you feel small to make themselves feel big. And maybe you did misspeak. So what? You didn't kill anybody and nothing bad happened, right? So just... It's a learning process. Yeah. You just go, hey, man, you're absolutely right. Don't, you know, take that ego and throw it out the door. Forget about it, right? Because I, I've literally talked with some people that are... I will, I will say they're like the top 10% of the top 10%. And they're like, oh, yeah, I get things wrong. I, I say things. I misquote. I misspeak. Like, yeah. The difference is it's on YouTube. You know, the difference is... It was on someone's you know podcast. Yeah, and now everybody gets to go. Well, I'm smarter than you, aha! Uh-huh, because you said something dumb. It's like, <laughs> come on, man, don't be that way, right? All you're doing, if if you're that person out there writing those kind of comments and being a troll or whatever, all you're doing is proving that no one wants to work with you, and that's why. But if you're out there trying real hard and you're putting it out there and you're you're being graceful to those that aren't being graceful with you, man. If I'm a hiring manager, I'm like, cool. Someone has a teachable spirit. Someone has the kind of personality that would be great to have on this team because 
Maybe they don't have all the all the the right skills right now, but who cares? I can teach you skills. Yeah. What I can't teach you is how to be a team player, how to be someone that wants to learn, or someone who has drive and tenacity. I can't teach that to you. You have to want it. And if I could see that, great. We we have crossed a major boundary because you now have a bunch of equity with me in the bank of trust because I'm seeing that in yep. you, right? And now it's like, okay, now let's talk about skills. If I bring you on, you can learn this. We're going to we're going to invest in you training and shadowing and doing all that stuff. Sitting behind somebody, man, get a mentor if you can. Oh, 100%. I'll tell you what, it's been my biggest I'm going to I'm going to admit it right here. Never had a mentor. Same. I did it all the hard way. Same. Dumb. Don't be like me. I'm dumb. <laughs> no. No, it, it was so difficult. Constant uphill battle. There is so many people out there willing. Just just ask. And, you know. Just ask. What the worst is going to happen. They're going to say, no, I'm not interested. You know? Then you, okay, you move on to the next. Because I know a lot of guys will, you know, it's it's like a charge thing. Because that, that's that's how they're putting food on their fa- on their table for their families. Right. It's using their skills to make some money. Usually it's not like crazy expensive. But if you see someone who's got great skills, they got a great teaching style, and it's worth it to give them, you know, 20, 50, maybe even $100 for the hour of undivided attention of their time or for them to hand over a set of kind of secret sauce notes that they don't just give out. Yeah. I'm happy to pay for good training. Oh, absolutely. I will pay for good training any day of the week. Yeah. Because good training is going to make you go through the roof. You're going to have something and you can learn a ton for free on YouTube and just the interwebs in general. I would never tell you that that is not the case. But to have someone who knows how to teach and put together a really good system of learning to getting you where you want to go, that might be worth it. And if you can save up that money, it could be a good uh, investment into your career. Absolutely. And what else comes along with that? Everybody can go, oh, I know that training. It's got reviews on, on Google. It's got reviews here. It's got reviews there. And people say nothing but good things about that. Yeah. So you've had that training. Awesome. I, I, again, you're putting money in the bank of trust for a hiring manager to go, okay, you are not only are you passionate about it and learning about it, but you even with the extra mile to put your money where your mouth was absolutely to really invest in your skills and your capabilities to be able to do this job well. And that's, again, those are, those are intangible qualities that are Few and far between. Don't get me wrong. I I grew up dirt, dirt poor. Very, very no money. Like, you know what would be good today? Meat. That, that'd that be tasty. <laughs> that would be a tasty thing. Mm, I like meat. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but here I'm going to have this bread instead because it's a whole lot cheaper. <laughs> you know? That's kind of what, what I, Daniel grew I, I up. Uh, uh, not always, yeah. but there were some times that that's, the, that's where we went through. So I, I really value my money a lot and I understand that it doesn't grow on trees. Trust me. And so there's a lot of good free resources out there. I try to be both. I try to give you good free stuff and give back to the community where people can just learn off of me. And I also try to make very high quality paid for training for my employers so that if you are a subscriber that you're getting your money's worth, you feel like this is worth it. Absolutely. Choose one thing and go, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to do what I got to do. I'm going to sell everything that ain't bolted down that I, that I can afford to lose. And I'm going to get that training. Yeah. It's, it, it really will help you to be able to put that kind of stuff on your resume. It will pay for itself in the long run. Yeah. We've unpacked so many great nuggets. And before we get on, move on to my, my, one of my most favorite segments, I want to talk about your YouTube channel because I think it is an amazing resource that again, going, going back to talking about giving back to the community and, you know, the valuable training and stuff. And, uh, yeah. Do you mind just telling us a little bit about it? Yeah, sure. So like I said, uh, you know, one day I was like, you know, I, I do this training in front of a camera every day. I know how to run a camera. I can figure all this stuff out. So, I. Uh, Went and bought me a laptop and I had a, I had a DSLR laying around. So I said, let me hook that up, make that a webcam. And I just started doing stuff that I thought was interesting. You know, what am I learning? If I'm learning it, I just put that on the, on the interwebs. And let the people see me learn. I don't care if you think, oh, you know everything about, obviously I'm learning it. Yeah. 
And then the more I kept doing it, the better I got at it. And it was more fun. And then I just started doing stuff that I, that I thought was fun. And that's what I do. So you're going to find all sorts of crazy stuff on my YouTube channel. <laughs> it bounces around. The, the algorithm is yet to be able to like figure out what to do with me. Because I'm like, one week, I'm, uh, hey, let's look at this APT in Southeast Asia. Actually, you know, uh, I read an article in the Hacker News, and it was really interesting about this malware gang that was infecting these servers because they had a zero day, and it was, and they were dropping their malware and doing this, and they were looking for, you know, they, they were, you know, doing Bitcoin mining. I actually got got mentioned in a, a malware source code. They put the the link to my YouTube video in their source code about wow. them. Yeah, it was crazy. It was a very surreal thing because. One of the uh, security researchers from Aqua Security, um, he contacted me and said, we found this in our honeypot and we found your video from looking at the link. I'm like, what? <laughs> What's going on? Right. So this is the kind of thing that you'll see. I'll be talking about threats or I'll be talking about like the last thing I put up was, like I said, I'm learning Golang. So I wanted to see, could I build a malicious binary with multiple states. So basically like an implant or a dropper that would call out for a PowerShell stage uh, malware to give me a reverse shell to Metasploit. And it worked. Mm. And it bypassed nice. Windows Defender. Like I had Defender completely on, completely updated. And it went, what's that? Uh, and Smart Screen was the only thing that jumped up. And I went, oh yeah, it's an unknown publisher. Just yes anyway, right? Social engineering, it's fun. Yeah, just just click through. You know how it is. All these things complain. Just click yes. And people will. And then you click through and then cool. I got shell. Uh, I did a whole series for, I think I was telling you about Port Swiggers Web Security Academy. Yeah. They have the apprentice track where they teach you about web application vulnerabilities and using Burp Suite to be able to hack those vulnerabilities. So I did a, a lab walkthrough for every one of the labs in the apprentice track. Here's what the lab is. Here's how we can solve the lab. And here's why that was solvable. Here's, so I kind of explain it while I'm hacking it. So a whole, whole playlist for that kind of stuff. So just rando stuff that kind of <laughs> pops into my head or I'm dealing with it and going, Oh, that's interesting. I should learn more about that. Help me make a YouTube video. So that's kind of how the YouTube goes. That's awesome. All right. So it's time for like one of my most favorite segments of this podcast is uh, called repeat after me. So I'm gonna say a sentence and then I want you to repeat back the first part and then fill in the blank with whatever comes to mind right away, all right? Okay, this sounds fun. This won't get me in trouble yes. at all. <laughs> <laughs> if I was starting today from zero and wanted to get into cybersecurity, I would blank. If I was starting from zero today and I wanted to learn cybersecurity, I would, I would learn operating systems and networking. Nice. Because the flaws are there. And if you don't know how those systems work, even if I had like exploits sitting right in front of me, this is what the exploit is. I probably wouldn't understand it very well. And that puts me in the category of a script kitty, <laughs> right? Yes, I can download a script offline and I can fire it. But if I don't know what it does, all I know is it affects X, Y, or Z technologies then I'm just firing and firing and firing until it hits something that it works on. And I go, Oh, look, I hacked. Yeah. Yeah, you did. But you don't really understand <laughs> that. Right. And if you want, That's we the all level start of hacker there. I am. Yeah. Hey, listen, we all start as script kitties. I, I have been a skid. And in some yeah. ways you'll always be a skid, right? Because there's things yeah. that you don't know yet, but you still have to incorporate into your bag of tricks until you understand right. it more. So you're always going to kind of start off as a skiddy. And then, but it's, are you going to stay there? You shouldn't, a, a true skid will stay there. They don't care to learn more about it. All they care about what that can do and just building up a, a, a kit that will allow them to attack technologies and give them access. Real hackers want to learn why that worked. Real hackers want to, real security people, not only just hackers, like as far as offensive security goes, but blue teamers as well. Because now if I understand how that exploit works, I can better defend against it. Oh, it's taking advantage of a default configuration. Well, there's a remote file inclusion vulnerability in my web app. What's a remote file inclusion vulnerability? Great question, <laughs> right? Skids don't care. They just go point, click, hack. 
point click heck cool that's fun where you go oh well i need this functionality to work but if i have to call to that well i need to i need to change the way my web app works so let me get with the developers and say hey is there any way that we can call this file without making a call to this file in, in an insecure way is there a more secure way we can do this because it's opening us up to or if i have a technology that means i got to get some patches out right this is a third party i'm going to my vendor hey we've got a you know a 9.8 cvss going on here I'm, I'm going to need that patch and I'm going to need it quick. Yep. Right. Is that going on? Do I have a good patching cycle? Will I be safe against that? Do I know how to build a Yara rule? Do I know how to use Sigma and incorporate those things into my workflow so that I can make sure that I can hunt down and find those vulnerabilities if I actually have them or not? Can I use a vulnerability scanner or something like Nessus? Will it have something, you know, does it have a current update that if I run the scanner, it would find that vulnerability for me? Let me know whether or not I'm, you start to get the idea. Yeah, absolutely. Being able to download. So, so that, that just starts with knowing your systems, knowing what the operating system is, knowing what the technology is and how it works. And that just, that's just a great way to start and, and learn programming, learn programming. <laughs> and I mentioned learn programming. Yes. So the next one, the biggest mistake I see people trying to get into cybersecurity is but the biggest mistake I see people trying to trying to get into cybersecurity is trying to uh, take a shortcut to the finish line. The biggest mistake is that they are not struggling with the, they, they struggle with it for a minute and go, they throw their hands up in the air and go, I'm, I'm done. I just, I just want to be able to, just want to be able to hack. I get it. <laughs> I do too. I absolutely just wish that it was easy, but if it were easy, everyone would do it. And it's not, that's, what's going to make you valuable is not only because here's the, here's a little inside baseball. You want to be a pen tester, right? In my world, that's what most people want to be. So that's why I continually reference pen testers. You want to be a pen tester. You understand that when you write that report, they're like, oh man, I was popping shells all day long. It was so, so much fun. <laughs> you write down, I pop shell this, I pop shell because of that, I pop shell because of this. Your client goes, well, aren't you the elite hacker? Good for you. Now what do I do? And you go, ah. They go, you were not worth my time and money. I will find somebody else. They do not pay for you to have a great time popping shells. They pay for you to find where their vulnerabilities are and in a report, tell them what that vulnerability was, why it's a vulnerability, how severe that is for them and their company and their risk to it actually being exploited in a real world scenario and what they can do to fix it. Those are the things you're going to be doing. If you can't do those things, you're going to have a hard time as a pen tester. If you don't want to do those things, you're going to have a hard time as a, as a pen tester. Matt, a lot of what you do in that work is talking with management, doing things like statement of work and scoping the engagement, getting, uh, you know, what, what's allowed and what's not allowed. What time is good? What time is not good? What systems are in scope? What systems are out of scope? Who do I call if we find that you have already been breached and who's my point of contact? What is an event that would inst instigate a contact con uh, that I would contact somebody, right? There's a ton of stuff that goes on underneath the hood, signing legal documents and NDAs and all this other fun stuff that goes along with that job. And then don't forget the report writing. So <laughs> you see a little red squiggly line up underneath something you wrote. You should probably take a look at it and go, Oh, I just misspelled received, you know, <laughs> because I misspell receive a lot. <laughs> right? No one wants to have a report that looks like it was written by a third grader. Okay. You are a professional. Polish those skills. Those are the biggest, like people try to just bypass that and go, cool, hacky stuff. I totally get it. That's what CTFs are for. Okay. You want to have fun hacking, go do CTFs and then have another line of work. If you want to do it as a, as a job, you need to get really good at writing those reports, dealing with management, getting buy-in from stakeholders, doing all that soft skill stuff that doesn't sound appealing and being able to talk with management in a way that they understand and why this risk and not just a come down with the fear hammer. You're going to lose all sorts of money. Your company's going to go under. Not that that's not true. That is true, but you need to be able to explain it to them why and how that would work itself out in a real life scenario yeah. and why 
getting a pen test that costs ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars for a week or two's worth of work is vital to the security of their system. You start to see that's not something we teach you in a book. Yeah. That's something you got to learn and, and have your ear to the ground about that. That's what things are. That's how people do business. <laughs> such, such great advice. All right. Finally, if you don't know what you want to do in cybersecurity, I recommend who, if you don't know what you want to do in cybersecurity, I would recommend doing a little bit of everything. And that way you can figure it out. I think that's where that home lab comes into play. Build a few things and even stuff that you don't like from the outset look that, that doesn't really look appealing to you. If it is security related, spin it up, take it for a spin around the block. You never know. You might just fall in love with that old jalopy <laughs> and go, this is my dream car. I love Waza. I really enjoy it. Man, this is such, man, I, I got so great at working with GoFish. And maybe I'm really good at social engineering and building phishing lures and, and being able to help companies because it's the number one way to get into a system is getting someone to click on a link or download something through an email or an SMS message. This is, this happens all day, every day. This is, that is real life hacking right there. Anybody I, I tell, I work in cybersecurity, like, can you hack my friend's Facebook? Yes. Oh my God. I absolutely can. And you know how I do it? I'd send them a phishing link and they click on it and it goes to my credential harvesting website and they type in their Facebook creds and then it redirects them because Facebook never logs you out. By the way, that yeah. security token lasts for like nine years or something. It's insane. <laughs> they do not want you logging out. So, but they see a log right. and go, Oh, I'll log in. Tick, 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 tick. And then my credential harvester goes, here's the username and password. Plus, I just redirected them back to Facebook, and they think they logged in. And now you can log in. <laughs> Don't do that, by the right. way. Right? That's a total <laughs> not cool move. And it's highly illegal. So I'm not right. advocating for that. I'm just telling you. That's how a lot of hacking gets done, is phishing. So maybe you're like, yeah, I never oh, thought yeah. about. On red teams, a lot of red teams, they build. It's a team, right? Hence the term team in red team. I, I, th I like to think of things in very glamorized and Hollywood kind of thing. It's like you're building that crackpot team of specialists to, you know, it's Ocean's Eleven, right? Think Ocean's Eleven. Yeah. We got a grease man. We got a grease man. Where we got someone that's great at, you know, social engineering. We got someone who's phenomenal at spinning up infrastructure for our C2 environment. So I got someone who is a crackpot maybe a crack pot, <laughs> but crack at, at like, <laughs> you know, doing malleable C2 profiles to bypass all the latest and greatest AV, EDR, XDR solutions. I got someone who's phenomenal at physical security. I got someone who's phenomenal at doing phishing. So they build these teams and, and maybe it's two or three people that are good at one or two of those skills. And so that's how that all gets fleshed out. But that's, that's what happens. So if you get really good at working with something like fishing, you can make that your primary job. I niche into, I'm great at fishing. I can help your company do better after you do your security awareness program and see how well, let's, let's test your, let's test your people, see how they do. So you go work for a company that specializes in end user security awareness training. And you're the person that helps spin up all the fishing infrastructure where now we're going to test and see how well they paid attention. How well did our training do? And then do remediation, send out another fish. You, you have to build all this stuff out. Yeah. Finding niches is just a, a really good idea. So spin up everything and anything, find out what you like, and then that's going to kind of lead you down that road. I never would have thought I would, I would find hardware hacking interest, interesting. I thought that is beyond the scope of this guy. Until one day I cracked open something and went, you art, huh? What is a you art? That's an interesting thing. <laughs> You mean if I, and I got out a multi, uh, a multimeter for saying it st the smart way, right? <laughs> Not my multimeter. I got out my multimeter and I started reading <laughs> voltages and going, okay, well, how do I know which one's the RX and the TX and the VCC and the ground? How do I know that? Okay. Well, the ground will do this because I got a, gr 
I, so I learned how to use the multimeter. I learned how to read those voltages and see that spikes and dips and steady voltages mean things. Oh, because it's all electrical signals, right? Oh, duh. Goes right back to the fundamentals of our IT learning is that it's all electrical signals and it does it in a digital way. It's either a one or a zero. It's a high voltage or a low voltage, which means one or zero. And because of that, I can tell, I can see a lot of data is passing on this. So it must be transmitting something out to me. Cool. I can see this kind of spikes up and then goes low. It's sitting there at a low voltage waiting for real. Okay. So that's the RX to T. I know how to find RX to T. By the way, I have a, a video on my YouTube channel where I discuss this whole <laughs> thing. It's like 45 minutes of me showing you how to connect to your PC, to the guts of a, like a wireless access point and going, that's so cool. It is super fun, bro. I could, I got down the rabbit hole and that stuff. It's so much fun. <laughs> I never would have thought that would be fun. But one day I thought, let me let me look into this. Let me just see what this is all about. And I was hooked. I love doing hardware hacking. That stuff is a lot of fun. That's so cool. Well, we've unpacked so much great advice and so many great tidbits. Any closing remarks you want to share? Any words of wisdom? Man, uh, the, the best words of wisdom I can give someone that is into cybersecurity is learn to get comfortable being uncomfortable, right? Learn to enjoy the struggle. There is something about struggling your way through something, especially when it's really hard and you just don't give up. You didn't give up and you see it through the end. Now you might have to ask for help and that's fine. Don't be afraid to ask for help. I, I don't want to work with somebody that thinks they know everything and won't ask anybody for help. No. They're going to take too long. And they're probably going to get it wrong and they're going to mess something up. If you don't know something, ask someone for help. And if there's no one to ask, start a community so that you can build a community of people to ask and start getting that ball rolling. So be willing to ask for help. Never give up. Do not avoid the struggle because there is so much experience and learning in that struggle that you cannot buy. I cannot teach it to you. I cannot create any training where I can teach you what's going to go on in your brain and in, in your soul, the learning that will happen, how it, the idea, I think the word would be assimilate. You assimilate that knowledge. <laughs> it becomes a part of you when you have struggle bust your way through that sucker. And once you do, you, you wouldn't sell that, that experience for nothing. That is gold to you. And you can put that on a resume and talk intelligibly about it and talk passionately about it. Those are the things please do not avoid. Don't be that person that says, oh, I, I tried to get Kali and I, I can't get it to work. Well, what do you know about virtualization? I don't know anything. Why did you skip virtualization? Right. You got to learn virtualization. Right? The, don't, don't bypass those things. That is gold for you. Trust me. Start with that foundation. Struggle your way through it. Learn the hard stuff. Find a niche. Find that little thing that you're like, man, I really like this. And then follow down there. Right now for me, it's red teaming and maldev. I love that stuff. It's so interesting. I, I don't, I know malware is bad, <laughs> but I'm just so fascinated with it. Yeah. And what you can do with it from a security standpoint, like if I know how to build malware, which I kind of do a little bit, but I'm, I'm getting better at it as I go. I'm getting more advanced as I continue to learn. And it's, it's a struggle session for me. It's really hard because I don't know a lot about the Windows API and user land and kernel and, you know, ring zero, ring one, all that stuff. But I'm learning about that. I know enough about it to talk about it, but I want to know enough about it to do it. I want to, right? That's where you need to be. Find that thing and just be like, I don't care how hard this is. I'm going I'm to see it through and do not give up. Take a break when you need to. Don't get burned out. Know how to like pace yourself, but don't give up on it, man. That, that, is, the, that is a superpower. Tenacity is a superpower. 100%. And thank you again for taking so much time and giving us such great advice. I'd love to have you back on the channel here again in the future. Anytime you want, man, just reach out. I, I'll do it all the time, man. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I really hope you guys enjoyed this episode and until next time, keep learning.